Uh, thanks for tuning in tonight. Um, so my name is Professor Diana Magliano, and I am a diabetes epidemiologist, as well as uh, as well as running the Masters of Public Health at Monash. So I have two roles, and so with my uh, epidemiology and research role, I work in the area of diabetes, and alongside that, I manage the teaching, which is a really nice mix for me, and it makes makes me really understand what graduates doing postgraduate training really need. Okay, so let's start with why study public health. So I don't think we have to look very far or very deeply to under, answer this question. We just have to think about what's happened in the world recently. We've seen bushfires. We've had, you know, a hundred year epidemic of COVID-19. We've had floods, not only in Australia, um, and all these episodes have an effect of health. Floods bring malaria, um, COVID brings enormous disruption to our lives, bushfires also causes terrible illnesses. And we've had other uh, kind of bad exposures, especially in Australia with the silicosis, um, the outbreak, it's not really an outbreak, but the idea that um, uh, mining those silica benches can cause you this disease silicosis and and understanding all these relationships of disease and the environment is what we do in public health in addition to this we've seen population demographics change we've seen our diets change over the last 30 years our jobs have changed from being very manual to being very automated and this has led to the epidemics of obesity it's led to smoking hypertension high cholesterol and even other exposures have arisen which cause disease such as vaping and we need to know how to manage all of these and what all these exposures mean for um, long-term health of populations and that's what we're doing in public health. So Monash has got a postgraduate public health degree and with this degree uh, it gives you incredible uh, research opportunities. You have the chance to network and learn from researchers across the precinct, and that's because the university or the medical school of the university is situated on the Alfred precinct. It's called the Alfred Alliance or A Plus Alliance. And alongside with the Alfred and the School of Medicine, it's a couple of different schools of medicine, we have a research institute called the Baker, we have the Burnett uh, Institute, which is about infectious diseases. And we have a um, site of La Trobe. Um, and we have one more, which I've actually forgotten the name of, ACBI, another re smaller research institute. Um, we have a long history of working in public health at Monash. Um, and I think we offer the Victoria's first Masters of Public Health. We have one of the biggest schools of public health in Asia Pacific. Pacific and Monash is really high in the university rankings and especially in the schools which um, um, teach public health postgraduate degrees. The one of the unique features of our school is because we're, um, or our department I should say, is because we're located at the hospital site, many of our lecturers are clinician researchers and this brings real world experience to the curriculum. Um, we also have a very collegial atmosphere now, with any Masters of Public Health, people are doing this degree after their um, undergraduate degree, and often there's some time between the undergraduate degree and their postgraduate degree. So they're often working. And so because of this, we have to offer a flexible study options. And our courses are designed with busy working professionals in mind. We have two, two different formats. We have a face-to-face -face format, where all the cores and even some other subjects are conducted in a face-to-face -face environment. You come in for lectures when we're not having a pandemic, that is. Um, and then we also have another mode called um, the, um, it's a multimodal and it's a distance education where the subjects are done uh, online and we have some block days for those subjects. And their only restriction there is that we ask the international students to attend the face-to-face -face component. So this is just a diagram of all the different kind of uh, smaller departments within the broader uh, School of, of Public Health and Preventative Medicine. And as you can see, we have, we have a big 
um, presence in clinical trial. And for those of you who don't know, we ran the largest clinical trial in Australia called the Esprit trial, which measured, which tested whether aspirin could be used to um, lower disability in an elderly population of those greater than 70. We've done lots of uh, population-based studies. We have a great presence in public health. We do some work in public health genomics. Um, we do work in health programs, implementation and evaluation, and we have the strongest workplace and environmental, environmental health masters in the country. Um, we have a health services management masters, and we are building our expertise in climate change and health. We also run some clinical registries and biobanks, in particular uh, registries, of cancer registries, and we've just started a registry of silicosis. So if you get this new nasty disease from um, mining uh, Caesar stone, uh, you get onto this registry, and that's to help us understand the impact of um, this new unhealthy exposure. Okay, so the, the way the course is set up is a bit complex, but we have three parts and we have three levels of entry. So if you come in directly from um, undergrad and you don't have any health training, you come into the 96 point masters, which will take you two years full-time, four years part-time. And that means your undergraduate, undergraduate degree was not a health-related degree. And you'll do 24 points with the part A, which starts with a building your public health knowledge. You'll do 24 credit points of part B, which tells you, which builds your foundations of public health. And then part C, where you do 48 points of that and you can specialize in a, a particular area of public health. And I'll talk about that in a minute. Or you can do a research component and that's like an honors year. Or, um, you, or you could just do a general master's public health where you just backfill all your electives with things that of, of, uh, are at, uh, which the things that are of interest to you. Now, if you have done honours or you have done um, a science undergraduate and you've worked in the field, like you've been a nurse or you've done some work with um, the health department or some kind of um, work experience that I deem relevant to the degree, you can come in with it some advanced standing and you only have to achieve a 72 credit points to get the degree. So it takes you less time, 1.5 years full-time or three years part-time, but you have to meet that requirement of um, related discipline degree and two years work experience. So you don't have to do the part A of the masters. And then if you're a clinician, and you've done part one of your specialist training exams, or you've done a PhD, you can, can come into and to get a master's with only doing 48 uh, credit points. So it's only eight subjects. And I will mention though, with that, you're pretty limited in what you can do because it's a very truncated master's. Um, and I've said that all there, but I also wanna mention, you can come into our master's um, directly from the Bachelor of Biomed Science at Monash, um, and you can get some advanced standing, but you have to do these, these uh, um, some combination of these subjects you, you see here. And if you really, if you fall into that category, the best thing to do is to call me, email me or Maria, um, and we'll discuss your case. Um, people who have done a Bachelor of Health Science or Bachelor of Public Health also have a direct um, pathway entry into the MPH and only have to do 72 points rather than the full 96 points. Um, now, in the, the last couple of years, we've introduced a new part of the master's and that's called the specialisations. And so we ask you to do the five core subjects and then we say you can choose a specialisation. So you, it means you graduate with a master in public health in epidemiology or a master of public health in global health or in health economics, et cetera, et cetera. And they're listed on the top of that slide. Um, and they, this can be done as a 72 point masters or a 96 point masters. And on the left here, you see the core units that we ask you to take. And then we suggest to you, um, well, we specify actually in many cases, which other subjects which will satisfy you having a masters in a specialization. So the example on the slide 
is a MPH in epidemiology and you'll see the core subjects on the left and on the right you'll see we say take also infectious diseases epidemiology take demography chronic diseases epidemiology regression methods which is a statistical component and then there's some space for a couple of electives and we think with that group of subjects you'll be really well placed to work as an epidemiologist in a university or the government or medic or medibank or something like that and we have similar um, formats for the other specializations so they're they're quite new you don't have to do it you can do just a general master's um, and just pick subjects that you want after you've done your core subjects but I think this is a really good way to get some really focused skills so what we'll teach you is I like to think we'll teach you how to understand and how to uh, interpret health data um, we'll teach you how to critically appraise the literature and understand study design and with these skills you can apply your public health knowledge and skills to various public health challenges um, you know like COVID understanding COVID for example we'll also also teach you some leadership uh, skills we'll teach you how to collaborate with other your class members how to work together to achieve an objectives of, of um, a certain project we'll teach you how to um, communicate give a talk talk to your colleagues and to the pu public um, we'll teach you how to create implement and evaluate a public health program um, how to design health policy and understand the basics of health economics. Okay, so one of the, uh, the newest additions to the Masters, and this is something that I run, is a subject which we, we call uh, a public health practicum, and it's a job readiness subject. And it's, it's worth two units together, so it's 12 units. And it's a subject where you actually go into a workplace. Um, so it's an industry placement subject and it's 20 hours per week. So it's three days at this workplace. It could be um, a research institute. It could be a university department. It could be the government. It could be the ABS, for example. Um, so I'm really flexible what you do. It can be an NGO like Liverwell or Diabetes Australia. And it involves work integrated learning. Um, and the students that do this are encouraged to find their own placement with help by me because I have lots of contacts. And if at all, if we can't get to something, I will I will find some, something for them. Um, um, and you you have to get a discrete project. So you work in the department like another employee. It's unpaid, unfortunately, but you get a discrete project. You meet with supervisors. You're a part of that team. You write up your project at the end, you give a talk to me and the examiners, and you also do some other assessments, like apply for a job, um, create a LinkedIn page and various bits and pieces. Um, it's highly competitive and you have to meet a certain academic threshold, which is everything's got to be greater than 65 points. So that's a midway through a credit. So you're going to ask me about job prospects and they've never been better, I would say. So in COVID, there were so many epidemiology jobs around, okay? So there was so many levels of epidemiology jobs, data jobs, um, managing program jobs, and there's always health promotion jobs also. So working for uh, with dietitians, making uh, material for health promotion, working with um, the Heart Foundation or Kidney Health Australia or Cancer Council, those kind of jobs. You can work in universities. You can work in the Department of Health. You can work in the local government. They're always running sort of um, sort of health programs. You can work in any non-government organisation. You can all work in like pharmaceutical industry like Pharma, Sanofi. Um, we've also had people work in uh, Medibank and Bupa and other health insurance. And these are the kind of job titles you look for in SEEK. Um, so there are often lots of jobs and I help, and I can also help you get jobs afterwards. Um, and this is just um, one of our old uh, pre previous students. Uh, she did her uh, MPH in, started in 2017 and she was really interested in, in health economics and 
she did a really good master's and she did some research within her master's. And uh, now she's gone to Oxford to do a PhD in health economics. So that's really, really exciting. And we're really proud of her achievements. In the last year, because our course got reviewed, we put in some new entry pathways. And this was a result of COVID. The government gave us 30 CSP places, which is uh, a cheaper place because they wanted to build up the skills in Victorians for epidemiology. And so they gave us... Um, Unfortunately, the CSB places are now finished, but from that, we started these grad certificates in epidemiology. So that is a four unit, small kind of course. So, so it gives you a grad cert, four units, and we specified the units. And we have one in epidemiology, public health and health promotion. Um, and then you can then, if you like that, if that works for you, you can then move on to the next level or move on to, into the masters and get credit for those subjects. So it gives you the taste of studying without a big commitment for it. Um, we are constantly revisiting our electives and doing mapping exercises to understand whether we're offering the right subjects to give students the right skills for the market. And so with this in mind, um, we've got some new units planned for 2024. And out of those, those four there, the one that's going to definitely run, because I've organised it already, is culture, society, and public health. So that talks about the social determinants of health, our culture, gender equity, diversity, and all those, how those things impact health. Um, we've also got a new health data analytics subject that's running through a, which we can, which students can do, that runs through another master's, master's of health analytics, but you're welcome to do some of those electives in your master's at, in your MPH. And I'm also organising now uh, a new subject of planetary health, which is consistent with climate and health and how our climate uh, is changing and also social media and health promotion. And that last line there says there's a new Masters of uh, Data Analytics that has started. It's super exciting. Um, and that offers some really interesting subjects for the for the students who like to flip numbers in their heads. So you can do the MPH, you can do some statistical subjects, you can choose some subjects in the data analytics masters and have a really numerate MPH. Okay, and that's all I'm going to say about that. And we're going to leave questions till a little bit later. Is that correct, Justin? Okay. Yeah, um, I think that sounds fine, Diana. Yeah. Okay, the last thing I want to say is I did this master, master's back when I was, um, I'm not going to tell you when because that would show you how old I was, I am, and I'd already done a PhD. So I did this after my PhD, which is the wrong way around, but I was just completely engrossed in this master's. It just blew my mind. It was so exciting. It's so different different, and you learn about how people live and how how they live affects their health. And I, and I, I really, I've never looked back because I was a, um, a bench scientist PhD and now I'm an epidemiologist. So there is such good scope if you like this um, space of learning and research. Okay, so now I am going to talk, I'm going to stop sharing and Kirsten's going to put some slides up on the Masters of Clinical Research, which is a master's that runs alongside our MPH and then Mark Hapgood is going to talk about another master's which runs alongside the clinical master's of clinical research, the master's of translational medicine, which is a, a fairly new master's too. Okay, so this is not the degree I run, but I do have some um, um, I have some experience in part of the, part of the learnings that come through this. So the master's I spoke about first is from uh, uh, for people sort of with any any background, but this. This Masters of Clinical Research is a master's for people who are doctors and nurses and pharmacists generally. They're the people who work in clinical health and they want to have um, in, um, learn about research and uh, improve their clinical research skills. And it's designed for busy working professionals who really want to advance their research skills. So they might work in, um, in their organisation and they want to learn how to take their work and how to re do some really meaningful research. And it's a really authentic learning opportunity 
Um, and we have two uh, streams. We have the clinical research stream and the translational medicine stream. Um, our learning in this master's, like any other master's at in the school, is flexible and it's a mixture of in-person block days and online learning. Now, the core subjects of biostats, epidemiology, research methods and clinical trials are subjects that come from the MPH. And so there'll be some face-to-face -face components there as well as completely online uh, versions of those subjects. In this master's, you also do research ethics, which is so important for research and becoming more important every day to me, at least in my world. And you might also learn about systematic um, reviews, which is how we combine much, uh, lots of research together to um, come to a more precise finding of a typical of a, of a uh, particular topic. Now, in this master's. Everyone does the research capstone unit, and that's 24 uh, credit points. Um, so it's all year, and you end up doing a project which is like an honours year. And if you do well enough in that project, you can use that as a stepping stone for a PhD application. So that's equivalent. It's enough research to be um, eligible to conduct a PhD. Um, and then on the other side of this slide is the structure for the translational medicine masters. And uh, Mark will talk about that further. Um, and I might stop there and let Mark take over at this point. Does that sound okay, Mark? Oh, that, <clears throat> that's fine. Thank you. I can share my slides here. Thanks, Kirsten. So if we go back to slide one. So we're oh, going to yeah. talk about the Master of Clinical Research, but the translational medicine stream of it. And translational medicine is, it's all about how do we get research findings from the research lab into something that can actually be used as a tangible entity that can help improve the health of patients. So we may find a new drug or a new treatment or a new way of doing things or a new medical device. How do we get that idea into something that patients can use and doctors can use? So that's the main focus of the translation of medicine. So it's translating ideas from ideas to reality. And very similar to what Diane has just told us, it's a master's degree, it's in two years. The first year on the left is you're doing coursework. There are some components that are core components, which I've shown here in bold, and some that are electives that you can choose between. <clears throat> so the core components is epidemiology, biostatistics, research ethics, and reviews and meta-analysis. These are common between the degree that Diana just spoke about, the uh, Master of Clinical Research, and they're also common to this degree as well. And these are to provide you with the skills and the background knowledge that you're going to need when you get into year two and you do your research project, which is the only thing that you, you're doing in the second year. And as Diana mentioned, depending on your background knowledge or the qualifications you have when you come into the course, you can start and do a full 96 credit points if you've just got a basic degree, or you can come in at a 72 points or 48 points, depending on your background. Um, the bits that I'll sort of talk about here is, is translational medicine. We have ideas coming out of basic research that's being done in the labs. And this degree is about how do we get those ideas around this circle diagram I've got here into something that can be used by patients. And that means we need to be able to figure out how and where do we get the resources to do this. And that involves talking with and getting support investment from people who have money, essentially. And I'll come into that on the pathways to the clinic. 
So this is looking at what are the mechanisms by which we can advance these ideas towards treatments. We do that in this unit here, an introduction to pathways to the clinic. And we also have an introduction to clinical trials that's slightly different to the electives that you're doing. The introduction here is for many of these ideas we want you to translate. It may be a medical device, it may be a cell-based therapies, the wound healing in the skin or other replacement of diseased organ. This here is more focused on what are the steps you need in order to be able to get that idea to the first stage to get it safe and ready to go into humans where it could be trialed in humans. So this is more an introduction to clinical trials and I'll talk a little bit about that in a moment. This here is a much more deep dive into clinical trials. It takes you all through the regulatory hurdles, how you conduct them, how you analyze them. This can be taken as elective. There's also the health economics, data management and research methods. So through all of this, you will then be well equipped for your research project. And in the second year, you'll identify a lab. We have a lot of projects that are put on offer that you can choose from. You'll talk to one of the labs, meet up with them and take on a project that you think really suits what your interests are. And got on the next slide, if I could get Kirsty to go to the next slide. Sorry, it seems to be stuck. Let me just try and reshare it. And so this is just a, <clears throat> giving you a bit of a summary overview of what are the different areas that you could do your research project in. We're very fortunate at the Alfred in that we've got some very large and very diverse leading departments in various fields. In particular, we've got a lot of people very specialized in neuroscience, immunology, gastroenterology, diabetes, et cetera. It's women's health, mental health, a huge section on trauma, brain and spinal trauma. We've got the Australian Centre for Blood Diseases next door. We've got the Burnett Institute. We've also got the Baker, which is focusing on cardiology and cardiovascular. So from all of these, there are quite a lot of experts in the field on the Alfred Plus site that you can talk to and decide which of these areas you would like to do your research project in. And the projects that you're doing are designed to have both the academic side of it, where you're in the academic world doing lab-based research, analyzing it, but also it will have a clinical component for it so that you're straddling that, I won't call it a chasm, but the, the gap between clinical and the academic sides. So you can see the problem from the clinical aspect, but you can also see the problem from the research aspect. And if I go on to the next slide. So this is just one of the two electives that we've got in there. And I've got this cartoon diagram to try and give you an overview of it. So for translating an idea into something that can be used by a patient or used by a doctor, there is a large pathway that needs to be followed. There's several different pathways depending on the nature of it. If it's a drug or a drug target, you may need to go down the pathway where you're trying to get uh, pharmaceutical companies involved to develop it for you. Many other discoveries that you made, made, you'll be wanting to set up a company and get investment into that company. So in this part of it, this unit, we get you to look at an idea or a concept that could be translated. And it involves you'll be working with a lot of teammates. It has a lot of emphasis on interpersonal skills. You need to work in groups effectively. You need to have leadership skills. You will learn those in this unit. You also need to have really good communication skills because you need to communicate across very different worlds. You need to be able to communicate with research scientists and academics in the scientific world. You also need to communicate with doctors and 
with patients. So you need to know clinical terminologies and languages. You need to be able to communicate with lay people. If you can't excite doctors about your discovery, they will not be using it. If you can't excite patients about the discovery, they probably won't be paying for it. You also need to be able to work in the commercial world. And the commercial world thinks quite differently from clinicians and from researchers. Their interest is creating treatments for patients, but their main interest is commercial. What can they afford? What can we do with it? And so for a lot of things that you're trying to translate, universities and ourselves, we don't have deep enough pockets to do this fully journey ourselves. We need to attract people who have got the money that can fund it and do the development and get it through. And so in this unit here, you will be taking an idea that you have been speaking to doctors, patients about, and you'll be working on that idea to come up with how can we develop that into a business plan that we will then be able to develop that into a treatment that's going to benefit these patients. And from that, you'll be doing a whole lot of these things here. The key aspect is you'll be engaging with people who are in the translational world. So as you're developing your plan, we'll have opportunities for you to speak with people who have made startup companies who are involved in contracts with Big Pharma to run your ideas past. And then eventually you'll present your plan as a pitch to an audience that includes professionals who actually work in the translation world to see how well you can convince them of the benefits and the investment potential. Uh, we switch to the next slide. And there's also the 5001 unit which is the introduction to clinical trials. And in this one, you'll mainly be looking at what is the pathway for a discovery, such as a biological, or it could be a device, or it could be a new drug. If you're going to take it through, you're going to need to trial it in humans. And this looks at what do you need to do in order to get your discovery to the level at which it can be safe to be given to a human. And you'll need, and here you'll learn about trial design, ethics, both human ethics for giving it to patients, but also animal ethics if you need to do preclinical work. Drug discovery, the regulatory requirements involved, but also the role of the stakeholders to be able to see it from different perspectives. A key part of this unit is there will be a work integrated learning aspect to it. And this is where you'll be placed into an active clinical trial that's going on to observe and to learn how the clinical trials are set up and run. There's also an opportunity in there for you to undertake the ICH GCP. So this is the, uh, this is the internationally recognized good clinical practice certificate. So if you're going to be working in the clinical trials field, this is a certificate that you can take as part of this unit. And at the end of it, if you pass that part of the course, you'll receive a certificate from the ICH that demonstrates that you have good, competent, good clinical skills. And this you can use in order to be able to participate in clinical trials over many different clinical trial centers and in other countries as well. And from there, if we go to the next slide, I think this is probably a good opportunity to introduce you to Yvonne. So Yvonne's come to us, she's doing the Master of Clinical Research, the Translational Medicine stream at the moment. Uh, she comes to us from the Philippines and she's just completing the coursework here and about to embark on her project here. So I'll just hand over to you, Yvonne, and perhaps you could give us just a little bit about your background and what attracted you to come to Monash to, to take the Translational Medicine Masters. Okay. Thank you, Mark. 
Um, so just to give you a bit of a background, I am a medical doctor from the Philippines, around three years into the clinical practice. I am a general practitioner with some training in pathology, and I've been a lecturer for public health and bio bi biology courses in the University of the Philippines. So I do enjoy the clinical practice and treating patients individually. However, maybe it was brought about my background in public health. So I did a bachelor degree in public health. So I felt like I wanted to do something grander than just treating patients on a one-on-one -on -one basis. Um, my father has been diabetic for about 30 years now, and he's been compliant with all the medications, the diet and all, but I feel sad for patients like my, my father, you know, they're very compliant. So um, rather than just uh, in, on my side as a medical doctor, rather than just prescribing medications that are taught to us by the guidelines, I want to discover new medications or technologies that can really have a big impact in this kinds of patients. That is why I chose this degree. And how would you say it's going so far? What's your experience of the degree? So um, I am about to be done with my first semester and everything has been really great so far. I actually got teary eyed after realizing that it's already the last week of lectures for this semester because truly I love every course unit that I have. For this semester, I took up biostatistics, epidemiology, research ethics, and um, TRM or the pathways to the clinic. And I've enjoyed learning it all despite the assessments coming almost every week. And also maybe because I'm currently writing papers as a research volunteer or research assistant, it makes me appreciate my units more. You know, I get to apply what I learned in biostatistics, like doing regression analysis on SPSS or doing critical appraisals in epidemiology. And like what Mark said, we are also taught soft skills like communication, teamwork. And these are actually the soft skills that you'll find really useful when you do find jobs later. Yep. That's great. And I suppose the other question would be, where do you go from, you finish at the end of your project, where do you see yourself going after that? Yes, so um, I someday hope to work as a researcher in a laboratory that specializes in diabetes and other chronic diseases research or something along the lines of neuroscience or behavioral science. And I also plan to, to continue what I love doing, which is teaching public health and epidemiology and still continue with my clinical practice. And so I believe that what I, whatever I am learning now through my course is necessary and relevant to my career goals. Um, it sounds a lot, but I trust that I am in good hands. And have you chosen your research project yet? Um, yes, I have chosen my research project. So I, I will be meeting my supervisor hopefully this week. So it's about um, alcohol use disorder and sleep disorders. Well, thank you very much, Yvonne. That's really great. Thanks thank so you. Much for that. And I'll hand back over to you, Justin. Yeah, great. Thank you, Mark, and thank you, Diana. Um, that was excellent. Really good overview. I think we covered off a lot there in a short period of time, a bit about the course, the structure, the careers, or the industry engagement, and also to hear from Yvonne as well. That was fantastic to get a current student's perspective. Um, I can see here um, Maria's busily answering all of your questions in the background. Um, we've got a few that we might be able to answer live so that we can cover off some of these audience questions um, a bit more quickly. Um, so I'll throw these open to both Mark and Diana because they might cross over um, sometimes. So we've got one here. How many contact hours per week are expected in the Master of Clinical Research? I guess we're asking that face-to-face -face hours in the, in the program. Um, I could probably jump in there to start with. Yeah. yeah. Depending on the electives that you do and the core units you do, Quite a lot of it can be in your own time. Some of the units do have quite a lot of contact hours. So the translation pathways to the clinic of 
brought in quite a lot of face-to-face -face teaching into that one because we really put a focus on the interpersonal skills so they can communicate at all different levels. So that one would have about, it's about two contact hours, between two to three contact hours a week. The rest of it is worked in your own time. Although having said that, for half of the course, you're actually working in a group of six to seven students where you organize your own times to meet and you can do it as a Zoom hybrid or you can meet face to face or you can meet in the coffee shop. It's purely up to you how you organize and do that. Fantastic. Um, I think we've got another one here. Maria might be answering it, but I'll, I'll throw it to Diana anyway because she might be interested to see this question. Can we opt for two electives in the MPH? For example, if I were to opt for both research and epidemiology, maybe that uh, means specialisation. I'm not sure. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's a good question. But before I answer that, I, I would like to say for any sort of unit at, in the masters, it's generally ten hours a week total time. Um, we say for one six credit point unit, ten hours of which maybe you'll get an hour and a half of lectures and another hour of tutes and then the rest of that time to make up the 10 hours is the work you do at home. So that's just broad brush in terms of per unit, 10 hours, okay? Um, so the way it works is and this is uh, one limitation. You can, if you do research, you can't do a specialisation. So research becomes your specialisation. Yeah, that makes sense. Yep. Good one. Um, this is maybe another one um, for both of you. Um, it just came in. If you're a full-time worker, i.e. nine till five, how does attending lectures, tutorials for the Master of Public Health part-time work? Um, so you would do the um, multimodal. So what you'll do the online versions. Um, so you'll do, if you're part-time, you'll do two, two subjects per semester. And you'll do them all online and there might be, say, for Epi and Stats, there'll be two block days each. So you'll have to take four days off work or study days for that first semester and the rest of the to, turn, to attend the block days, which are sort of like 9.30 to 4.30. And the, or the rest of the stuff is done outside of work hours. Can I also add that that's different for international students? Yes. International students, you have to attend face-to-face. -face. It's part of the, the Australian visa requirement. Yep. Good one. Um, there's a couple more questions coming in. This is great. Uh, it's really interactive and the students are obviously um, really interested in what you guys had to say. So um, uh, will experience in medical reception be looked upon favourably for entry? I'm not sure if they were talking about the clinical research or the MPH degree uh, here. Yeah. Um, I think probably talking about the MPH. Depends how long for, but I, I'd have to think about it. <laughs> Probably not, though, I'd say. Yeah. And if they apply, they can always submit that for, for assessment and consideration yeah. anyway, can't they? Yeah. So that, that's good. So if you are unsure, you can always submit the application and um, you know, if the admissions team are unsure, it'll probably come through to Diana anyway for, yes. for approval that's and right. assessment. Yeah. Yes. Good one. And there's um, a question there on the Master of Translational Medicine. Is it suitable for yeah. healthcare professionals? No, it's suitable for all graduates. So if you've got an undergraduate degree, it's suitable for you as well. The master's can be a pathway to doing a PhD if you're purely on academic research. The important aspect of the translational medicine is it also teaches you how to identify which aspects of your research can be translated. So there's no requirement for you to have a healthcare degree before entering that course. Um, another one here from um, one of the attendees. Can we choose to have some units on campus and some online as a full-time domestic student? Yes, you can. Yep. Good. Um, also, Diana, one of the other questions that sort of comes through quite regularly is um, at what point, if a student's coming into the MPH, at what point do they have to nominate or choose their specialisation? Um, uh, you, you can do it straight up, but you don't have to. You can do it after the first uh, semester or even after the first year. Yeah, okay. Because some people think I want to do epidemiology and have a really numerate master's, but then don't like stats. And so they have to do a rethink. Yeah, very good. 
Um, another question here, they're coming in thick and fast now. Can we do a double specialisation example, global health and epi in the 72 credit point pathway for domestic? You can't do that officially. So if you do a specialisation of epidemiology and you also like um, uh, health promotion, maybe you could do one elective of health promotion, but you'll only get one specialisation on your written on your degree. Yep, that's good. Um, I think Maria's answering some via um, via typing, but I might just read them out anyway. Uh, can we choose to do some units on campus? Uh, we've gone through that one. Yeah. Um, I think we've covered most of them. Some of the students might be typing um, more questions, but yeah, you've, you've gone through those really, really clearly, which has been good. There doesn't seem to be any more questions coming in. Um, I, I was interested about the work integrated learning, um, Diana. It's really, really good, and I think our prospective students should, you know, be considering that. I, re I remember you saying that there was some requirement, like the sixty-five percent minimum average. What other criteria will they go through to be considered for the, you know, to get connected to the work industry, the the will unit? Yeah. So there's no no other criteria really. Though we like you to do it in the back of your degree. There's no point doing it at the front of the degree. We like you to have some skills first and do it. Um, and I like you to be proactive because it's a job readiness. And so I want you to come to me and say, I want to do infectious diseases. Um, and I will find you or help you find an infectious diseases placement. Um, so it's a really, it's a placement where you really have to drive your own learning uh, and drive what you want. So it's a really good learning curve, how, how to be proactive in the, the work market. Yeah, and I've, I've had such a good experience with it. Uh, yeah, we've had just had two, two students who did health promotion at Baker. They work with the dietitians and they just had a great time. That's really, really good. So, yeah, the students, if you're listening there to what Diana said, you know, put your head down in the first year, make sure you're at least getting that 65% average, if not exceeding it, um, and yeah. then put forward a good case for the work industry learning um, elective unit. Um, and Marcus, what is Oh, sorry, go on. I was going to say one more comment. If you want to do the research specialisation and do a year of research, that also has got um, a threshold. You do have to get even a little bit higher for that and you have to have um, specific subjects to allow yourself, allow you to do the analytical part of the research. Yep, yep, good. I think, Mark, similar similar question there. We've got a question from the audience. What, what are the work placement options for international students um, after or during the Master of Clinical Research? For the work integrated learning aspect, international and domestic, they yep. do it exactly the same. It's several weeks of the course that they do it. I'm not sure about after the degree is finished. I think I think that would be you know them building the relationships if they've done something during the course and you know we, they've they've sort of built the relationships maybe with the researchers in the second year like Yvonne's about to go into her research approaching you know I think opportunities will will come about if they're a proactive student. So. so a lot of our international students have got jobs. So one of them is just flying through her jobs, like you know, she's a dentist from India and she's got a job after a master's and she got a job during a master's as well, working yeah. at a clinic part-time. Yeah. Um, does the MPH course provide us with good clinical practice certificate? No, it doesn't, but you can just do the course pretty easily online. I, that's not, that's yeah. not difficult to do because I had to do it as well so okay that one's done um what's the work placements don't think there's any more questions coming in we'll leave it for a little bit more in case some of the students are typing this has been really good I mean we've had lots of questions and, and lots of very questions I know that there was a lot that we answered while you guys were talking um because a lot of the students were asking about admission um you know what scores they need and and especially they were asking about um the credit points and if they'd be doing the 1.5 years, the one or the two years, that's been great. They're interested to find out where they would actually enter the course. Um, I just want to make one more comment while you're thinking. Yep. The biggest explosion I can see in the job market is data jobs, data and health jobs. It's just everywhere, bioinformatics, deep learning, artificial intelligence. So that, that's a really big part of the job market, not only in health, in even can, in marketing and retail, but especially in health as well. Yeah, 
That's good. And what, what are some, I mean, you mentioned before about the dentist student, um, Diana, what are some other examples of maybe some companies or some industries that some of our grads have gone into? It can be domestic or international. Um, okay, so we've had people who work at um, local government in council running programs, health promotion programs. We had someone who worked in Parks Victoria running programs um, in that NGO. Uh, we've had people work at the Department of Health and Human Services, pre-COVID and during COVID and after COVID. Um, we've had people who got jobs at universities, various universities around town. We've had people who got a job at the police force, analysing their data. Um, yeah, lots of different jobs. Yeah, fantastic. Um, and what about the Alfred location? I mean, um, that's quite unique, I think, to, to Monash, having that teaching location. Um, what would be some of the advantages? I mean, you went over a lot of them in the presentation, but for, for the students that are maybe, you know, from interstate or from overseas or um, or maybe coming from different backgrounds, what can they expect? That, that, that How would that give them an advantage um, being so close to the medical professionals there? Well, it's really good when you're trying to find um, research projects because all the researchers have offices in the university parts or and all the baker for example and then work in the hospital so you know you can go meet with them um, and learn about your research project it's good for finding placements for the practicum and it's good for your learning because you know that these um, lecturers are clinician scientists and so they do the work in the space and then they teach the work Teach, teach in the space and if you do your work in the same place as you teach you're often really really cutting edge that's great um so i was just going to leave up here the the um a couple of websites for the students to go to and the youtube and the instagram um i know there's still probably some questions coming in um maria's typing a response to one of them um, what are some MPH units you would recommend to students who do not have a background in healthcare? That's a good question because I know we had a question from a Bachelor of Arts student um, earlier, which was really great to show some. We've got students coming from everywhere, but yeah, what units? What MPH units would you recommend? Uh, so you have, depending on, it doesn't matter what you do, you have to do your core units anyway, and then it would depend on your interests. So if you didn't have healthcare, maybe you do some in, um, sort of occupational health. Um, subjects or planetary health subject or something a bit different or policy subjects but I've got to say you you might want to ask me who does the best in the in the masters in terms of marks and we have um, yearly or academic awards you think doctors do the best it's not the doctors it's the engineers <laughs> so and they're not into health so you know so that's I think that's always really interesting our engineer always tops the course generally engineers do very well those mathematic skills, isn't it, going to epidemiology? Well, I think it's engineers know how to how to learn. I think it's that. I don't know. I, I've actually thought about it a bit, but um, yeah. All right. So I'll let it go for another couple of minutes just to see if any questions come in. A few more seconds. We've um, it looks like we've covered them all. There was quite a lot of questions there. Um. We're pretty much dead on time. So, um, yeah, we might just wind it up. Um, I'd like to say thank you to Professor Diana Magliano for giving us that presentation and also to Dr. Mark Hadgood for your informative comments and presentation and also Yvonne. Um, it was fantastic having you here and hear about how you got into the course and where you've come from and why you're doing the course and what you want to do next. It was really great. Um, I'd like to thank all the listeners out there, all the participants. It was great that you guys were really engaging and wanted to ask us questions and were interested um, in engaging. Um, thank you very much. Um, as I said, I've left a few um, links on the website there, uh, on the screen, I should say, for you if you want to go and um, search for more information. We will put this presentation um, or this webinar up on our YouTube account. So that's the Monash Uni MNHS, Medicine, Nursing, Health Sciences, that stands for. So we put all our um, webinars up on that platform um, in the following days. Um, and if you're, you know, looking to find out a bit more about Monash socially and see what's happening on the social side of things, um, then you can always jump onto the socials such as Instagram and check out what's happening there. So, yeah, thanks to everyone once again. Uh, it was fantastic to have you join us. Um, and, yeah, we hope to see you at Monash in the future. Thank you. Bye.
Thanks, guys.